Hey, hey, welcome everyone to this week's episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and today I want to talk about something very specific, something that I used to do, something that a lot of you guys still do, and I just want to bring it to the forefront of your mind. We're all about retail arbitrage today, and I want to talk to you about Amazon and retail arbitrage in 2021 and how this can or should or shouldn't or otherwise fit into your business model. So I just want to let you guys know that's what we are talking about today. I have nothing against retail arbitrage. We're going to go through and talk about the different things and why I think it can benefit you for a time, but then you really need to start switching into a long-term business model. And things have changed for 2021. There's some new policies out from Amazon that have come down the pipeline that you really need to be aware of um, and, and just some things that should change your mind a little bit about what you're doing. So um, for those of you guys who want to join the Facebook group, if you have no idea we have a Facebook group, the Amazon Files podcast has a Amazon Files Facebook group and you can join us by going to mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word. Today's code word is prison. So if you come and use the hashtag prison, that means that we know you listen to an episode, you like what you hear, you want to be part of the community. So mommyincome.com slash join us with the code word prison so we can talk about, um, so we can have you in the group and you can ask questions and get answers to wholesale and bundling and retail arbitrage and everything Amazon there. Great community, almost 4,000 people. Each and every individual that is in our group has use a code word to get in. We ask for that so it's not just everybody joining every single group out there and just want, you know, have you ever seen anybody's Facebook profile where they're like, they're members of 5,412 groups. <laughs> That's not really what we want here. We want people that really want to grow their businesses on Amazon by joining our Amazon Files community. So mommyincome.com slash join us, code word prison. Don't say we didn't give you a code word. We get that often too. I don't have a code word. Every episode or most episodes have a code word. So that you can join us. So please feel free to do that. So before we get into retail arbitrage, I want to personally invite you to our first since COVID um, in-person workshop event. As the um, government in different states and, and the federal level are releasing um, and, and lifting mask mandates and, and limiting social distancing now that mo a lot of people have access to the vaccine and people are getting vaccinated, we're feeling a lot more comfortable coming into in-person events. And I got to tell you, y'all, I am so excited to get together with you in person. I miss people. I miss hugs. I miss face-to-face -face interactions. I miss cups of coffee and cups of wine and just hanging out with real people and having Amazon conversations. And so I'm really excited for our first ever since 2020 has come and gone since COVID um, in-person workshop. It's going to be in Las Vegas in conjunction with the ASD marketplace there. Um, I love going to ASD for certain reasons. Um, I love trade shows. I love to talk to people in person. I like to touch and feel products to see if they're good, to see if they fit with what we're selling. ASD is a great opportunity to do, number one, the trade show, and number two, a workshop. So the Confident Wholesale Bundlers Workshop is coming back on offline and in person. I can't wait to meet y'all. It's mommyincome.com slash workshop for you. There's two options. One option is if you're already a wholesale bundle student, you can join right away. Um, if you're not, you'll have to take the course and get the workshop at the same time. So you have plenty of time. This is not till August. Um, so I would love to be able to meet you there. Spots are very limited. We want to make sure that everyone has space to be distanced if they so choose to be. We will be doing group work. So um, make sure that you're comfortable with all that. But I'd love to see each and every one of you. And because you are a savvy podcast listener, I will give you a coupon code in just a moment. I want to go over exactly what is going to happen in the workshop so that you guys understand what you're signing up for. Because I mean, we don't need confusion here, right? Friday night is going to be a meet and greet party, a chance for me to meet all of you and your smiling faces and work and meet with the other uh, sellers that will be coming to the workshop. Um, we'll have some food, we'll have some drinks, conversation, get to know one another. And then Saturday morning, we are going to work together to increase your research skills so that you can find bundle opportunities faster than ever using the bundle framework. So we'll be working in small groups. Um, we're going to de be developing bundles from scratch together in just a 
few hours that you will present at the end of the day with your group. And it's going to be awesome. So many people just love these aha moments that they get in these workshops. Sunday is optional trade show walkthrough. So if you're a trade show vet and you don't need a walkthrough because you're like, hey, I got this. Um, totally skip it. It's up to you. But uh, if you really want a little hand holding experience, walking through the trade show, learning how to have these conversations with vendors, um, you can sign up for the workshop walkthroughs along with your workshop. I cannot wait to meet you. There's small, um, there's only 24 spots available for these things. We want to make sure that we keep distance, we keep safe, we keep healthy, but we keep learning and growing our business. The Amazon is on fire these days. Things are going really well for a lot of people, and I want you to be a part of that. So mommyincome.com slash workshop. And if you were use the code workshop 50 only for podcast listeners, you're going to save $50 off of that. So please make sure you go to mommyincome.com slash workshop and use the workshop 50 code to save some money on your workshop. So you can't wait to meet you in August. All right, let's talk about retail arbitrage. So I'm going to give you a little uh, a backstory. If you have, don't remember, I need a refresher. I started with retail arbitrage. I started with retail arbitrage in 2008 when I started selling on Amazon. I would I started with books. I would go to garage sales. I would go to Salvation Army stores, thrift stores, uh, estate sales. I, I literally scanned books in like my grandma's house. Not gonna lie, like I was looking for anything and everything that was cheap to sell because I was on a super tight budget when I first started. And I just wanted to see, is this Amazon thing gonna work? Is it going, can I flip these things? Can I make money? Can I use a scanner? Can I figure this stuff out? And it was a great thing. And I moved from books to quickly learning that you could do retail arbitrage in stores. What is retail arbitrage? Bottom line, most of you guys know, but I'm just gonna define it for the one person that has no idea. They're new here, they don't know. Retail arbitrage is simply buying something from a retail establishment um, not quite garage sales, although that can still be arbitrage. You're just flipping something. It's more called thrift, thrifting than anything else. But going to a retail establishment, buying something off of the shelf, whether it's clearance or regular price, and selling it for more someplace else. So that is just the idea of retail arbitrage. Going to retail stores, walking into a Best Buy, walking into a Target, walking into a Walmart, a Walgreens, a Rite Aid, a CVS, a, a Big Lots, and, and scanning products with your phone to see if um, that you can make more money on them on Amazon. So I started with retail arbitrage and grew my business fast and furious, not going to lie, in 2008, 2009, 2010, I consider that the Midas touch days of retail arbitrage. I swear I couldn't scan hardly anything that wasn't going to make, a, excuse me, wasn't going to make a profit on Amazon. So those days I would, I would scan, I would start, I, I felt like I could make money on anything and that helped grow my business very quickly. However, um, as we started to grow and change and scale, we were realizing that there was a lot of pitfalls involved once you hit a certain, a certain level. Say maybe it's like 10,000 a month or 20,000 a month that you're spending and all of a sudden it becomes harder and harder to spend the same amount of money on things and then actually flip them for profit. And what's the, the craziest part about that is then at some point you either have to hire people who can shop for you um, alongside of you, or you have to scale back or supplement your, your retail arbitrage with something else. And so we opted for plan B, which was um, looking and realizing that we couldn't fill our cart fast enough with enough stuff. And we started working 60 to 80 hours a week. When I say we, it's my mom and I, my mom is my business partner. She has been since 2014. And we've been cooking along doing um, retail arbitrage and then we moved into wholesale and wholesale bundles pretty much at the same time. We realized with wholesale, which we loved, we could access pretty much unlimited amount of inventory. The trouble with that was that um, the margins were pretty thin. The margins with, with Amazon fees and FBA fees and shipping and packaging and everything else, we weren't really making a whole lot of money. We were going to have to push a lot of volume in order to just make, you know, spending dollars to make dimes, that sort of thing. And so we thought well, something's got to give. And so we started wholesale bundling. And so when we did wholesale bundling, we purchasing items from wholesalers, bundling together in a way that's highly complimentary, brings value to the customer. And that was the winning business model that we tried after all these things. That was the breakthrough that we wanted. But I never said, you'll never hear me say that retail arbitrage was not profitable. 
retail arbitrage was the foundation of my business for many years. And I'm not against retail arbitrage. So don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that retail arbitrage is bad, it's wrong, and you shouldn't do it. Never am I gonna say that. I'm going to give you caution tips. I'm gonna give you reality. And you can make your own decision. If you love retail arbitrage, which y'all, I'm gonna tell you, I loved retail arbitrage for a long time. I still get bit by the retail arbitrage bug and start scanning things every now and then at stores because I literally can't help myself. I love tracing down a deal. I love treasure hunting is what I call it. But I found another outlet for my treasure hunting because what I didn't want to do was jeopardize my million dollar business with retail arbitrage. And so we're gonna talk about the different things, the, the time and money efforts, the limitations, the um, pitfalls of some of it, and then maybe how you can solve some of those so that you can have a little bit of a balance because you know, I want to, I want to see you doing wholesale and wholesale bundles sooner than later um, for your own sake. This has nothing to do with me. This has nothing to do with, I don't care if you buy wholesale or buy wholesale bundles or learn from somebody else or learn for free. That has nothing to do with it. I care about your business and you, and I don't want you to build yourself a prison like I did. Because that was the hard part about retail arbitrage is that as I was growing, as we were like literally doing super well uh, with retail arbitrage and making a ton of profit and cooking right along, we were building ourselves a prison. If we didn't go buy inventory this week and send it in, our sales went significantly down. If there's a times where you're sick and you can't go pound the pavement to fill up your cart, to fill up your shelves, you miss out on all that profit. And if you, even if you have some replenishables and you can't go to the store and get more, then you have to come up with all these. It's, it's like new putting new products on yourself every single week with no ability to really replenish them or no ability to come back to them. If it's all clearance, if it's all deals, if it's all one-off type items, it really is disappointing to have to build your business model on something that's so unstable. And so it's just something to be thinking about while you're going through this process because we build ourselves a prison. We were working and working. We'd go out. We used to start going twice a week. We'd go retail arbitraging. We'd go to our favorite honey holes like Ollie's and Big Lots and Meyer and Walmart and Target. And we'd hit all these different spots over and over and over again. Became significantly harder to purchase stuff for re from retail arbitrage to um, find the inventory enough to support the growth. And that's where the prison comes in because we were spending more hours scanning more products. And as competition was coming in and people are getting the hang of this retail arbitrage thing, um, prices started coming down. So we were really had thin margins to start competing on. Some things were great and some things were terrible. So we really had to focus on how are we going to scale? Now, listen, if you don't want to scale your business and you're doing retail arbitrage and you're okay with high risk items, high risk retail arbitrage, then that's so awesome. I'm, I'm happy however you can make your success as long as it's legal and above board. <laughs> um, but seriously though, like if you really want a scalable business, if you want to do this Amazon thing long term, then lean in and listen up and put your big girl pants on because I'm going to spit the truth to you. I'm not going to sugarcoat this in any way. I'm going to give you things that I've been talking with Leslie and with Riverbend. She comes on um, pretty much quarterly to update us on all the Amazon policies, rules, regulations, things with pesticides and hazmat. And, um, you know, there's some new stuff coming up um, in the next couple of months too. We'll have Leslie back on to talk about those things. But the reality is there are always new risks involved when you're coming to selling on Amazon. And so this is why you need to be aware of them to make the best choice for your business. Okay, so let's talk about the time that it takes to do retail arbitrage. So when you're doing retail, the major issues of it and how you can get out before you build yourself a prison, or if you're already here and you're relating to this, you're going to be like, oh, how do I get out of this? Um, it, how do you get out of it is wholesale bundles. That's, I mean, not going to sugarcoat that at all. Wholesale bundles is how I got out of retail arbitrage and now how I'm working basically one day a week on this business and still making really, really decent money because I don't have to do retail arbitrage anymore. I can work from Florida. I can work from Texas. I can work from Alaska. I can work from anywhere there's Wi-Fi because I don't have to go out from store to store and load up my car and bring the stuff in and bring it out and sticker scrape and you know all the different things and all that. So time consuming. 
retail arbitrage requires you to be out during regular business hours looking for products. So when the stores are open, and I don't know about you, but during COVID and even still now, there's a ton of stores around here that have limited hours. They don't have enough people working, so they can't stay open as late as they used to or open as early as they used to. So there's a lot of restricted hours. Um, there's also long lines. Sometimes um, we've been facing really long lines at stores here lately because, it, you know, there's a employment shortage in where I am and a lot of people aren't working still. And so it's really, you know, lines are long. You've got to drive from store to store and scanning. Um, it's also, the thing that's time consuming about a retail arbitrage is also if you have outdated equipment, if you have an older phone that's not super fast, or you have low signals or hardly any Wi-Fi, um, you're, you're really going to suffer from time. You know, if it's taking 10 to 15 seconds to load every single thing you scan with your phone, that's really time consuming to where if you had something like a scan fob or a Bluetooth scanner that you could scan products with fat, it's faster. Um, so thinking about the time it takes to scan each item and, you know, do you keep good records of that? Do you keep records of things you've already scanned so you don't forget and rescan a whole bunch of stuff you've already done before? Make sure you're paying attention to that because that will eat up all of your time. And as you grow, it takes longer to spend the money when you're out and about. Um, most of, a lot of us like, oh my gosh, if you knew what to do personally with $10,000, someone handed you $10,000 right now and said, um, go spend it on retail arbitrage and you have eight hours and you have to make 75% or more ROI on everything you're bringing in, that would be a struggle. The reason I suggest 75% ROI or more, mostly 100%, is because with retail arbitrage, single unit items, competition is inevitable. If somebody's going to discover the same product that you discover, they're going to realize where the margins are and they're going to price tank you to get the buy box, especially if it's a longer tail item that doesn't sell through as quickly. So at $10,000 a week for inventory, that's a lot of shopping for one person, let alone one person, how about two people? It ended up being more and more uh, hours. And so I just didn't want to continue that role. I remember finding myself exhausted because it's not just the shopping, right? Say you're working a nine to five or you're working somewhere else or part-time and then one whole day you have to go out. You've got to get your gas. You've got to go to your different stores. You've got to get all the stuff in your car. Then you've got to get it home and unpack it and repack it and, and organize it and scrape the stickers off if they have stickers. I mean, hello, Tuesday morning and Ollie's and big lots. Those stickers can be a pain. So that takes a little bit longer too. So it's not just the shopping. It's all the other prep and all the other things that are involved in retail arbitrage. It's just something that makes it very time consuming. Another thing about retail arbitrage that makes makes it more of a prison than a business or you're creating yourself. I don't want to call it a prison. I guess I can. I felt trapped. I felt like a prisoner of my, my own business. It's not necessarily a business at that point. It's more of a job. If you're doing all the work and you're doing all the things for all the things all the time, then you're just building yourself a different job. You might have a job, you're building a job. I want you to build a business. A business means you build up things that you can then outsource to other people so that you're the CEO, you're the head honcho, you can run the show while everyone is doing all of the work or most of the work. That is running a company. That's making top level decisions and then having everyone else well-trained so that they can do all the rest of the work. That's what, wouldn't you like that? Is that something that you would want? Even if it was just one person or a small team, if that's something you want, you have to consider how your business is structured and how you would go about teaching other people what you do so that you don't have to do all the things anymore. I hope that's part of your goal. If it isn't, schedule a coaching call. I'd love to take a chat with you and just see where you're at in your business and how you want to grow. Limitations of retail arbitrage are real. The, the number one thing that always scared me about retail arbitrage was the limitations of inventory. It was, it's a crapshoot, let's be honest. When you go out to the store and you're looking for products for inventory, you're going to be scanning things, new things, different things, things that are on sale, things that are on clearance, things that are on special buy, um, new products. There is no guarantee that you're going to fill up your cart with anything. There's no guarantee of that. There's no guarantee that you're going to find enough product to make profit on in profits. You might find some, but they're decent and maybe there's only one or two on the shelf. And then you go to another store and they have none. And you go to another store and they have none. 
So there's limits on purchasing power. There's also stores, places like Kohl's, places like um, Target have done this in many places where they, if they see you buying all of something, they will limit you to two or three purchases. You cannot clear their shelves. You cannot purchase all of their inventory. There are some stores that are very strict about this. And so you have to deal with the, the limits on what you can buy. And what happens if you find a slam dunk, a hidden gem, a pay dirt, golden nugget type of item, and there's only two there or one, or you can't buy more and more of that. So that's something else. And like the, the idea there is you want to be able to find a gold nugget item that you can call up your wholesaler and buy caseloads because you found a really good seller and you can just reorder and reorder and place an email order and then sit back and relax and you're making all that money and you can order a hundred units or a thousand units or five thousand units or two units, whatever it is you want, whatever your budget can afford. But with retail arbitrage, you don't have that option you're just very limited to whatever they have on the shelf. Now, of course, back in the day, I used to go to retail arbitrage and I found some really great products that I couldn't get wholesale because the minimums were far too large for me to afford at the time. So I went to a store manager and I asked them if I could buy it by the case and they said, yes. So there's a tip for you if you wanna be able, especially grocery items. Grocery has really high, um, their vend a lot of grocery vendors have high distribution because um, they they um, want you to they really they want you to excuse me they want they want you to order like three thousand pounds a week uh, from their distributors and they have tons of distributors but like as grocery retailers there's not a lot of margin in grocery so you got to buy a lot of it and have tons and tons of products so that's part of how grocery works and i realize with grocery products it's best to order from the store if they'll order by the case for you so there's a tip for you but also the limitations of retail arbitrage are like dealing with tax exemptions so when you have tax exemptions, um, you want you don't want to pay taxes on this stuff because you're you're going to be you know charged the sales tax and then you're not going to pass that sales tax on to your people. So you want to get a, a tax exemption. But a lot of these companies are not accepting tax exemption forms anymore. So you have to deal with that either on the front end or the back end. And you really should be getting that refund back um, for tax for sales tax um, as a wholesale purchase. You don't have to pay sales tax on anything because they know you're charging sales tax when you sell your item. So sales tax is not an issue with wholesalers. That's why they ask you to be a legitimate business and prove it because then you don't have to pay sales tax and neither do they. Uh, so that's part of complying with tax laws as well. Unfriendly stores and resellers can also be some limitations that you have. There's certain stores that give people a hard time if you're buying, you know, like a, a, all of the shelf, they, they limit you because they don't want you to clear their shelves. They want other customers to be able to have access. I mean, most people, I remember one time tampons were on sale and it was like a specific kind that's hard to find. And I think I was buying like 25 boxes of these, which was all they had and they wouldn't let me. They're like, you can't buy all of these. This is all we've got. Like, can you buy, you know, just five of them? And I was like, oh, okay. What was I supposed to say at that point? Like, I'm not going to be a jerk and be like, no, I want to buy all of them. I mean, was it my right to probably? But the idea is I don't, I don't like conflict and I don't want to argue with store managers and get kicked out. But that's part of what you run into sometimes when people see you scanning or there's just some awkward things that you're going to have to deal with um, with doing these things. Quantity limits constantly looking for new items. Now, I'm constantly looking for new bundles right now too. I'm not, I mean, constantly meaning a couple times a week, not every day, not all the time. The greatest thing about wholesale bundles that you don't have with retail arbitrage is the competition level. I never have to worry when I release my bundle, if somebody is going to tank my price. It's not happening. No one's jumping on my bundles because they're mine. They're, they're, they're competition proof because I have custom packaging, because I have my own brand, um, because I've created that and it's not expensive and it's not crazy and I can do it all from home. So I love that. Um, and plus you don't, with retail arbitrage, you also don't have any control over the listing. Have you ever experienced this? Have you ever purchased a retail ar arbitrage item, sent it into Amazon, and then someone buys it and the customer comes back and gets really mad at you and, and leaves a bad review or bad feedback because they got something that was different than what the listing said? 
that's because the owner of the listing, the person that listed it or other people listing on that can update features or pictures or anything else. And the packaging could have been updated with a lesser quantity. Do you guys know that that's, what hap that's, that's what's happening right now with uh, inflation? Um, there's, I mean, when I'm not even gonna get into economics or political stuff right now, absolutely not. But uh, inflation is a real thing, it's happening. Um, and what's happening is the manufacturers are changing, are keeping the packaging the same, and they're changing the qual the quantity of what's inside. So a box of wheat thins used to be 12 ounces of wheat thins, and now it's 9.5 or 10 ounces. So you're paying the same price, maybe even a few cents more, but you're not getting as much. And if the packaging changes and the listing changes and your item doesn't match, you can get in trouble for that. You're not listing the exact thing. So you don't have control over the listings and that's really scary. Okay, and then account woes. So this is the biggest reason why I, I put red flags up with retail arbitrage. I just say red flags because red flags are something that you need to, it, it's a warning. It needs to be, a, you need to be aware of what you're walking into before you actually um, decide that this is something you wanna continue doing. Suspension issues. Uh, there's been times, here's a retail arbitrage story I have for you. I'm glad I didn't get suspended for this one. Um, was I purchased something, retail arbitrage. It looked like it had a corner ding on the box, but nothing was wrong with it. It wasn't opened. It was just a corner ding. So I put it like new. I sent it into Amazon. The person returned it, and it was a completely different item inside than what was on the box. Now, could the customer have done that? Possibly, but I never opened it to find out. It was just, it seemed like a fluke thing. What might've happened was someone resealed the box, sent it in, something like that. Like that generally doesn't happen with manufactured items. It's possible, of course, but it was like a return that maybe somebody heat sealed the box back or something. I don't know. It was, a, it was kind of a nightmare and I had to just bite the bullet and say, sorry, my mistake. And I almost got in trouble from Amazon from that. Um, that's in, in authentic claims. There are times where people report, like there's a lot of people that shop at TJ Maxx and Home Goods and um, Marshalls and places like that for higher end stuff like Michael Kors bags or Kate Spade or, you know, name brand type stuff, shoes, bras, everything like that, but they don't have original manufacturer tags. They have tags from TJ Maxx, um, but they don't have original manufacturer tags on them. And that proposes a problem for people like a customer. This actually happened to me about a month and a half ago. I purchased a pair of Calvin Klein pumps on Amazon. I love my Calvin Klein pumps. They're my favorite and I love them and I have several pairs. And one of my pairs got damaged and I wanted the new pair. So I ordered them on Amazon. They came in a plain box. Okay, no beef there. It wasn't like the, the Calvin Klein box they normally come in when I buy them at a store. Okay, no problem. I understand boxes are damaged. This was a brand new box. It's fine. But when I opened it up, they didn't have any sort of tags on them. They didn't have the same Calvin Klein paper that went with normal. You open it up and it has this certain branding on them. And then I compared them to the, the shoes that I was getting ready to get rid of because they were damaged. And they look nothing like them. They have the same color. They're the same height but the bottoms were different. They didn't have the same tag on that. They, the, the, they make a little silver tag that goes on the back of these shoes and they're, they're just cute shoes. But these did not line up. They did not look the same at all to the point where there was significant differences. And I thought, I'm not sure if this is inauthentic, but they didn't even fit the same. I wear a solid size seven of Calvin Klein pumps and I have probably five pair of them in different colors. These were a solid size seven, just like normal, and they were too small. And so it made me really think these were inauthentic, although the appearance of them at first glance would look like that they're real. So even if someone bought these authentically from Marshall, CJ Maxx, this place, whatever, and they sent them to me, um, I returned them and was like, these are, I mean, I didn't report them as inauthentic because I felt bad. I probably should have. They could have been fake. But the reality is that this happens with retail arbitrage and instead I just sent them back. But the idea there is that there's, there's inauthentic claims If people, especially expensive things, have any sort of doubts that it's not real, they're probably gonna return it and report it as inauthentic. So if you don't have 
wholesale invoices to prove that you bought that from an authentic retailer, they will not accept your cash register receipts anymore, especially from places like TJ. They do accept them from some places. From, from some places we have seen, uh, Leslie even told me, Leslie from Riverbend Consulting told me, they do accept cash register receipts that are within 90 days, I think, 90 to 180 days. And the UPC on the barcode of the product has to match the UPC on the receipt. And if you buy from TJ Maxx, Marshalls, uh, places that have their own SKUs, their own UPC codes um, for your receipt, they will never match. And then the Amazon will say, sorry, that's not authentic. If it has, if you're buying a box of Kleenex and you scan the barcode at Walmart, that barcode is going to match the barcode and the UPC number on your receipt. At TJ Maxx, they use their own SKUs, and so it, it's not going to match. So that's really a big deal, and you need to pay attention to it if you're buying that. You, some people have taken pictures of the item with the tag at the receipt, but is that something you really want to do? Do you want to go through all of that work for, for a couple of handbags? I don't know. That's up to you, I guess. Okay, brand restrictions. There's a ton of brand restrictions. A lot of people think you have to sell big brand name, high brand name um, items in order to make money on Amazon. You do not. There's more generic, unfamiliar brands that people sell on Amazon all the time and people don't care as much. There's some people if hey, if you want a coach bag, you want a coach bag, great, buy one. Um, but there are a lot of people that will buy a black handbag that has gold trim or you know pink or whatever it is that you want um, that doesn't have to necessarily be a brand they have they care more about the attributes is it uh does it have a handle is it a crossbody does it have four or five pockets does it have a phone pocket does it latch does it zip does it button those are the things people are looking for they type those things in rather than major brand names people use brand names sure of course there's always exceptions we all do but the but you can sell non-branded items just the same. So there's brand restrictions. There's category restrictions. Category restrictions are across the board. Um, when you, for, especially if you're first starting, you're going to be restricted in certain categories until you can kind of prove yourself to Amazon. Um, so there's always that. But then all the other things that require approval for new products and new categories and intellectual property infringement. Have you ever tried to, you bought a bunch of stuff retail arbitrage, you went to go list it on Amazon and then realized that all of a sudden it was restricted or you had inventory. This happened to me with Under Armour uh, about five years ago, six years ago now. Wow, it's been a long time. We were buying Under Armour sports bras like it was going out of style. It was just so popular and it was just had this huge boom. And we, we were selling those hand over fist for tons of profit. And all of a sudden, Under Armour didn't like this, and they told Amazon, we no longer want third-party sellers, or we want approved third-party sellers. And we had thousands of dollars of inventory at Amazon. They all of a sudden decided, you're no longer allowed to sell Under Armour. Please be approved here. We were not approved, and we had thousands of dollars of inventory we couldn't sell. And we couldn't take back because there was all over the you know, limit or whatever. So you're stuck. Now, that's crazy. That's risky for your business. Is that something that you want to regularly engage in? Because if you're selling big name brands, household names, things like that, that can happen at any time. The, the key here is what do you want for your business? Do you want to be pounding the pavement, going out, picking stuff off the shelf week after week after week because it's fun? Yeah, there's an enjoyable element to that for sure. But you know what else is enjoyable? life, hobbies, and family. Maybe not everybody's family, <laughs> but seriously though, like these things are enjoyable. And wouldn't you rather have more free time to do things that you love rather than, you know, yeah, this is a business. I love business. I'm like addicted to business. Let me be honest. I love to create businesses, new ideas. I, I see business in everything I do, but I also have fun hobbies. I have a family. I love to do other things. And so I don't want to be out doing 80 hours a week of work. So wherever you are in your business, consider the risks. Consider the risks involved. Do you want to have your account shut down because you cannot prove that you bought a Michael Kors bag from Marshalls and that it's authentic? 
Do you want to be out there scanning every day after work or on the weekends, trying to build your business? Or would you rather cozy up with a cup of coffee, sit outside in your lanai, have some, whatever it is you're doing and do it from a computer. Look up wholesale items, create new bundles and sell something competition proof, something that no one will price your tank your price on because you created it. Would you rather spend a few hours looking for products that you can buy by the caseload versus and have delivered even to a prep center, even better, where you don't have to touch it? Does that sound good to you? It's totally cool if it doesn't. Because I still get my treasure hunt on. I just do it for eBay and I do it for Facebook Marketplace instead of for Amazon because Amazon's my bread and butter. Amazon is the main source of income in our household. And because of that, I will not jeopardize it with retail arbitrage items because it is very risky. So what is it that you really want? Because if that's okay with you and you're just, it's working for now, so that's cool. Working for now doesn't mean working forever. It worked for now for me for a long time, years and years. But then there was this tipping point where it's like, gosh, I'm really, really working way too much. I'm kind of a ship passing in the night around here and I really would like my life back. So it's all about what you want and what you desire. Do you want to continue doing retail arbitrage or do you want to start making a transition into something that's easier? At first, nothing's easier. When you're learning, you're a beginner. So you can't expect to just go out and kill it when you don't know what you're doing. You have to learn proper research techniques. You have to learn what's good and right for you, what you want to be selling and wholesale. And everyone's always like, I can't find vendors. Y'all, I'm gonna be really tough on you right this second. If you can't find wholesale vendors, it's because A, you don't know how to find them looking for them, or B, you're not looking hard enough. You haven't been to a trade show. You haven't even been to a trade show website. Because if you go to a trade show website, you can find wholesalers. If you can go to a store, you can find wholesalers. You just flip over the box of, or the bag or the packaging and you look at manufactured by Nestle company, blah, blah, blah. There's usually a website. You go to the toy aisle, you go to the electronic aisle, you go to the clothing aisle and you say manufactured by XYZ. Why? Because it's required by law that they disclose where or who is manufacturing the item. So you can reach out to them. And when you go to their .com, you can see become a dealer, become a reseller, become a wholesaler. And you ask for a catalog. You give them your, your wholesaler license and, or your, your reseller's license. And you say, hey, I'd like to open an account. I'm not joking that it's that easy. It really is. So if it's something you want to do, do it now, do it today. Go to mommyincome.com slash 100, the number 100, and you can find a bunch of wholesale vendors right now today by using these methods. It's free information to find for you. So dig, dig a little deeper. If you didn't find it on the first page, look at the second page. You don't have to be stuck in the retail arbitrage prison forever if you don't want to. It's a choice that you make. So if you need more help with wholesaler, wholesaling, if you need more help with bundling, if you wanna get out of retail arbitrage prison, Come to the workshop. I'd love to work with you personally um, to be able to get your bundling off the ground so that you can start building something that will last long term. Mommyincome.com slash workshop. I'd love to see you there. If you want to learn more about wholesaling, if you want to do all that, there's lots of stuff on our YouTube channel. There's lots of stuff in this podcast. There's stuff on our blog. There's mommyincome.com has lots of resources for you. So there's no excuse as to how or why. It's about really what you want, what you don't want, and how are you going to take the next small step to get there. So I'd love to see you at a workshop. I'd love to see you in the Wholesale Bundle class, in the, in the Facebook group. There's all kinds of resources. So if you're done with retail arbitrage, if you're overwhelmed, if you're tired of it, there are good quality answers for you. And yeah, you're not going to do it overnight. It takes a process. It's slow. It's 80-20. 80% of your time doing what you're already doing, 20% of your time doing something new. And then it starts to go from 70-30 then 50-50, you know, you kind of go down the scale and pretty soon you're doing more wholesale than you are retail arbitrage and you just do it slow. Slow, consistent steps equals progress. Dream big, step small. That's how it works. Have a bigger idea, take small steps towards it consistently and you will find results. Guys, I know. 
that y'all could be anywhere else, listening to anyone else at any time. I don't take that for granted. I'm thankful that you're here and listening. This podcast is right. It, it's just for you. It's for your information. It's for you to be encouraged and motivated to keep moving and keep working towards the goals that you have in your life. I'm here to support you. You can reach out to me at any time. Hit me up in the DMs. Hit me up in emails, on Facebook, wherever you are. Um, I'd love to support you in whatever way you can. Until next time, I'll see you same time, same place next week on the Amazon Files.